Hey guys, Deslin Magic here, and since we've just had the release of Innistrad Midnight Hunt, we've got part one of Mark Rosewater answering questions about it. And while he does tend to kind of deflect and gaslight and make excuses and lie, it's still kind of interesting because he'll, um, well, throw other people under the bus and kind of, you know, give us a little peek behind the curtain, as I always say. So, um, it's kind of interesting, aggravating, and everything in between, so you know I'm going to cover it. And this one is really weird. I gotta say, he usually directly embeds the tweets, but then always for some reason one or two go missing. I don't know why people are like, oh, my tweet question that I knew was going to be public got featured. Let me delete it real quick. I don't get it. So this time, instead of even just screenshots of the tweets, he just literally typed the questions. He's like, hey, people ask me this. So we're kind of taking his word for it. And I wonder if he did this because um, like 10 people asked the same question and then other people are like, well, why didn't you pick me? That's my guess. I'm not sure he ever actually addresses it. So when I read the first question, you're going to know real quick why I'm not 100% sure that an actual human being asked him this. What makes Daybound slash Nightbound successful? Who says it is? Whereas the day-night mechanic from your original playtest with Richard Garfield was not. You're probably thinking, wait, Richard Garfield, the creator of MTG? Yeah, and if you wonder what he's been up to lately, um, he did Keyforge, which was very close to the perfect TCG. It was like the cure for net decking. It was the cure for overpriced crap because every single deck was like you, you couldn't modify it and it all cost the same. Except people just went on eBay and net decked the entire deck. You, you could just be like, oh, here, this contains the best combination of cards. Here, buy it. 300 bucks. So that failed miserably. I like the idea, though. So close to perfect. I mean, this guy knows what he's doing. I mean, he invented magic, and then, well, Mark came in and ruined it. And a bunch of other Seattle dumpster-fired dumbasses. Then, uh, didn't he make, like, Flesh and Blood or something to help with that? Um, I, I might be wrong there. I, I know it was Artifact, which, my God, did Steam just come in and ruin that? Or Steam. Valve. Well, what's the difference? They just over-monetized it. They, 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 they made it too greedy. That was not Richard's fault. And then I heard he's working on even another one. I thought I heard about this like a week or two ago. It's called like, I thought it was like Sunforge or something. I thought like it got funded in like 12 hours or something. I heard it was like some GoFundMe thing, which guys don't use Kickstarter or GoFundMe. They're awful. They have such a liberal bias. They, they just steal money from people. They are awful. They are run by lunatics. Use Give, Send, Go. So anyway, that's what Richard's up to. But if you're wondering, oh, did Richard work on this set? And we, we're just hearing about it now. No, he's referring to the original Innistrad, of which, of course, Richard Garfield was a team member for the design. So that was supposed to have a day-night cycle as well. So I'm just going to burn through this entire answer because I can't really summarize it, and it's really interesting. So he says, uh, for those who haven't read, uh, read the design article about uh, Daybound Nightbound, the earliest incarnation, dubbed Day Night, was first tried in the early design of original Innistrad, of which Richard Garfield was a team member. I had asked the design team to brainstorm how to make werewolves as flavorful as possible. Tom Le Le Peel, Le Pile, something like that, uh, suggested uh, using double-faced cards, something that Duel Masters, a trading card game that we make for Japan... Uh, had used. I suggested day night, which brings a game piece onto the battlefield that tracks when it's day and when it's night. In my initial version, get this, there was a track on both sides that you advance along whenever a spell was cast by a player. Every three spells would toggle day or night to the other side. So it was kind of like a progressive time thing where it took... I guess it'd be eight hours to cast a spell. I mean, not really, but, you know, you kind of get the gist of it. Four hours! It'd be four hours! Oh my god, I would have heard about that. Because day is 12 and night is 12 and three flips anyway. I think it was God's we get like 16 hours of darkness. But anyway, he says, we liked day and night. It was a lot of fun and it was flavorful. We just liked double face cards more for some reason. And the mindset at the time was that we were only choosing one thing. Obviously, with 2020 hindsight, uh, the correct choice was making use of both elements. But that wasn't something we even considered at the time. It was hard enough convincing the rest of R&D that double face cards were a thing we were supposed to be doing that's because everybody hated it we've hated it ever since and you still standing by it being a good idea is delusional you absolute moron trying to convince them at the same time that having outside game components was okay would have probably been too big of a challenge the real question is why is firing you not too big of a challenge at this point it really should be easy i guarantee you one or all of them said but what about sleeves and drafts and then Mark's response was, but I want to do it anyway. It'll be so cool and people will think I'm so cool for designing it. And then just take that and copy and paste it for the next like 15 years. So basically his answer was, um, it was a good idea, but they didn't want to do it because it was too much of a shock to the system. And so now we did it. 
The second question is pretty good here. Is Wizards thinking about errataing the previous werewolves that have the cast no spells slash cast two spells transform conditions to have daybound and nightbound? I don't remember a single werewolf having a, a zero or two spell cast exactly precisely. Maybe it's like one card. I, am I just missing it? I don't know. I didn't play the original Instrad, so who knows? I just remember transform conditions. I don't remember them all being the same, but I don't know. It's been a hot minute since <laughs> Shadows. And Mark says, it had always been my plan to make sure the old and new werewolves lined up. Yeah, shocker. They're going to try and update the text on a paper card written in ink. Uh, I don't know why they think this is okay. I don't know why anybody thinks that's okay, but they keep doing it. Uh, for example, one of the earlier incarnations of Daybound Nightbound literally spelled out that all human werewolves transformed when it became night, and all werewolves transformed when it became day. Oh, that would have been a disaster. <laughs> have you guys seen some of the really harsh flip conditions in some of the old ones? You can't just make it that easy where it's like, I did nothing. Haha, <laughs> flip it over. Oh, look at this side. Wow. As we designed other cards using Daybound Nightbound, it changed from referring to werewolves to referencing Daybound Nightbound permanents instead, as there were a lot of cool non-werewolf designs. And see, pulling in something other than werewolves on the same uh, mechanic is actually really smart to me. Because then, especially in draft and sealed, it really cuts both ways. Then he said, I had numerous talks with the rules manager at the time, and we were uh, talking about what we needed to do to make that happen. I should stress that during uh, that that during vision design, the daybound nightbound triggers exactly match the old werewolf triggers. Is it just me? Were all of them the same and I'm just remembering it wrong? Because I remember everyone being different or something. I, I don't know. Whatever. Who cares? So then during set design, as they were playing with daybound nightbound, they realized they had the opportunity to fine tune some things about how werewolves transform. For example, the old trigger only cared that nobody cast spells on a turn. So if you took the turn off from sp uh, casting spells, your opponent could cast an instant at the end of the turn. Oh, that's right. Which would prevent your werewolves from transforming uh it was kind of annoying and more of an unintended consequence of how we uh templated the trigger at the time so set design fixed it also daybound nightbound creatures entering on their nightbound side uh if it was night proved to be a cool play upgrade so that stayed as well when I came back during set design, repeating my desire to errata the old werewolves, I got a lot of resistance. Daybound Nightbound uh, had mechanically drifted enough since vision design that using errata became a pretty significant change, and research and development uh, has a standing rule about functional errata, i.e. cards should work the way the words on them say they do. What a concept. So once again, Mark wanted to, like, revise, what, a hundred cards or whatever? And then R&D is like, no, it's paper and ink. We want people to be able to read it, and it works that way instead of having to check every single card, uh, you know, on, on some BS database that doesn't work half the time to see if some keyword you've never heard of five years from now might have been added retroactively. So, yeah, shocker that R&D thinks that Mark's dumb idea is a dumb idea. They've already fragmented the game so hard, why not just do it on digital? And then the same exact card works completely differently in paper. He might say to me, but Des, that's insane and confusing. Um, look at Arena. You can play A-series cards that don't even exist. You can play Ixalan reprints that don't make any sense in Standard because it's not Standard, but only in Best of 1, but not Best of 3, but they still call it Standard. And, and like I said, some of the other A-series cards you look them up in the Gatherer, they literally do not exist. They are not real cards, and yet I'm playing with them in my deck on Arena. In Standard. In official Standard tournaments talk to me about fragmented are you kidding me it, it can't get worse jump on mtgo and add day night who gives a shit although mtgo is less fragmented than arena arena is kind of a nightmare but anyway uh basically he ends with yeah we're not doing that next up the dumbest question in this entire article this set felt a little werewolf light what's up with that bitch have you been on playing standard in the highly competitive platinum and diamond leagues in last week it doesn't feel werewolf light to me in case you're some kind of absolute moron, it's vampire light, and I'll let you guess why that might be. Could it be because Crimson Vow was split off into its own set when it was part of the set initially, and all the vampires are just filler garbage? So Mark says, let's start by looking at werewolf uh, creature numbers from past Innistrad sets. Original Innistrad, 12 werewolves, 4 common, 4 uncommon, 4 rare. I actually wonder if that was on purpose, that's actually interesting. Out of 264 cards, that's 4.5%. Dark Ascension had, uh, remember, because it was uh, it was a multi-set block thing, um, seven werewolves, two common, two uncommon, two rare, one mythic, out of 158 cards, which is still actually 4.4%. I think, if I remember correctly, and this is years ago, the middle set was always the small one, and they, they were always in sets of three, but anyway. Then we had uh, Avacyn Restored, zero werewolves, 
Then fast forward to uh, Shadows of Ranstrad. We had 12 werewolves. I, I already know, without even looking, it's got to be like 20, it, if if not like 30 in Midnight Hunt. It, I just remember just werewolf after werewolf. I mean, there there had to have been 12 in the first day of spoilers. All right, so um, 12 werewolves, four common, six uncommon, two rare uh, in Shadows. Out of 297 cards, that's 4%. And then Eldr Eldritch Moon had eight more, two, five, and, and then one mythic. But some were like abominations. It didn't really count, but that was out of 205, so another 4%. So almost 4% across the board. Oh, here we go. Now let's look at Innistrad Midnight Hunt. Okay, I'm scrolling down. Didn't want to ruin it. Oh, 19. Okay, so it's it's lower than I thought, but still, I mean, it's almost like double. So five common, eight uncommon, and six rares, which we all know, you know, the, the common uncommon tend to be like, okay, maybe good, maybe not, maybe draft fillers, you know, whatever. Just tribal boosters, but I mean, six rares. Come on, out of 277, that's 6.9, nice percent. That's like over 50% higher than the average old set. So no, it isn't Werewolf Light. You're an idiot, whoever asked that. And werewolves are the strongest thing in the set, so I, I, I don't know what set you're looking at, or what meta you're looking at, or what stupid subreddit or forum you're on, but you're wrong. Can people just learn how to deck build and learn how to read the meta on their own? Is that too much to ask? I mean, obviously, yes. Whatever, even I'm disinterested in magic at this point. I could see people not wanting to study it because Arena's an absolute shit show. So he goes on to do more stats and how it's like it's a 58 to 65% increase depending upon how you look at it, and that's over just the winner. So he says, but why can't there be more werewolves? Because they're already broken. Okay, number one, werewolves. On Innistrad, at least, need to be double-faced cards. There's just a limit on how many double-faced cards we can put into a set from a logistical standpoint. Yeah, they have to be on their own um, sheet, and I think sheets are 52, so the number has to be divisible by 52. Now, has to is a little strong. There's these things called drop cards, but they try not to use them because they seem to show up in packs. It's just like a blank black and white card with a barcode and... People have pulled them constantly over the last 20 years and been like, what's this? If you're wondering, I think they're worth like 30 cents. So get this. I know all of you probably already suspected this if you're paying attention. Midnight Hunt already has over double the TDFCs that the original Innistrad did. Yeah, everything in this damn set flips over. And all but four of the red and green double face cards are werewolf cards. Oh, TDFCs are transforming double face cards. I should probably say that. Oh, and one of which is Arlen, who's a werewolf planeswalker. In addition, for the first time, we put werewolves in other colors, one white, one blue, and three black. So that's just bullet point number one. Number two, werewolves have a consistent design constraint that makes it difficult to design too many without them starting to resemble one another. That's why they apparently turn them into slivers. I mean, I think they stopped short of flying, but th then they have one that's like pseudo unblockable. They had trample, they had first strike, they had, I think, double strike. I don't know if they did life link. Yeah, they basically gave them everything already. So, like, what are you going to do? Oh, it's a big wolf. It's a vanilla wolf. It's slightly bigger than its casting cost, which that they already did. I mean, like, yeah, what would you put on the more werewolves? Uh, he also kind of hints that, like, th th there had to be room for things other than werewolves in the set. Let me just summarize this. Shut the f*** up, you stupid net decker. Your werewolves are too powerful already, and there actually are more than there should have been. You're insane. Okay, the next question is, I have a question. Is this just a collection of the most stupid questions he could find? Why wasn't there a mythic werewolf in a werewolf theme set? There is, Arlen. Next question, will we have a Jund werewolf commander? Oh my god, just shut up. No, because Jund is on a different plane. Oh, you meant the color combination? Maybe you should have said that, asshole. I think my opinion on these stupid ass bullshit irrelevant nicknames that are purposely misleading for the purpose of lowered to get above new players and, and pretending to be an elite pro wannabe yeah i think i've made that opinion real clear because it's not an opinion it's a fact he goes on to say about you know balancing and color and how they designed it and how that won't work and how the person's an idiot there i summarized it next question oh my god where does he find these people twitter obviously i just answered my own question okay it is an awesome set, but only one legendary werewolf and then no question mark for some reason. I mean, there are mythic dragons and vampires in the set, but not a mythic werewolf. Wait, did he just use legendary and mythic interchangeably like he thinks they're the same thing? And then he, he undercuts his own question. Tovalar is very good. Oh, that's right. Tovalar is in the set and he's legendary. Or did you mean mythic? Or did you mean both? Because I'm pretty sure Arlen is mythic. Maybe she's rare. I could check. I don't give a shit because these people are idiots and not worth my time. So Tovalar is very good, but can we expect more commander options for werewolves in Innistrad, Crimson Vow, since so many vampires made their appearance here? Let me just explain something to you commander-obsessed morons out there. 
Okay, we get it. Commander, it's popular. It's only popular because people who aren't assholes build decks that work differently every time. So instead of just, oh, the same old uh, blah, whatever, you know, four of those, four of those, four of those, and eh, whatever, same combo, same cards, same strategy, aka modern and standard constructed, you've got 99 plus one singleton where you have no idea what cards are going to show up. I mean, you might see 15 cards out of your 99 in a game. And then 15 completely different cards the next game. That's the whole point. You get a lot of value, chaos, strategy, the high skill level, decision making is huge, and it's policed by the community. And then Wizard stepped in and ruined it by printing commander decks, and then now Planeswalkers can be commanders, but only the ones that they approve, and now you can have two commanders, oh boy, because they have partner. And then you just got the overpowered garbage that they've been putting in, like, uh, I could name some, but then somebody in the comments, that's not overpowered. In the last uh, 10 years, I think it's been, they've printed some really egregious front cards on the Commander products. Then there was the Horizons garbage that ruined multiple formats. Then there was the uh, Commander Legends. And then we get the clear and obvious Commander cards inserted into Standard because they ruined Standard and nobody wants to play it anymore, so now they're pandering to you assholes in the Commander community. And I don't mean all of you, I mean the ones who constantly want to build more decks and, and upgrade stuff and just, it can never be done and like, okay, cool, I like deck building too, but, you know, I thought while recording this I would have found it by now, I can't find it on my Discord or saved on my computer or on a wiki or by Googling it, okay, whatever, but the number of legendary cards printed per year has gone absolutely batshit crazy in the last three to four years. It's like ten times what it used to be. I think in 2014 it was like 30 or 20 or something, and now it's it's like 150. I wish I had the hard numbers to read you, but it has gone up insane, and people are sick of it. Because nobody wants power creep or mandatory upgrades in their format, and the format that's most popular right now is Commander. I mean, technically, anything goes, just play whatever you want, Kitchen Table is... I believe they said 10 times the size of Commander, believe it or not, but for structured play and for a play that has a name, I guess, uh, that's the one. So, Wizards focusing on it and catering to you guys and, and the whole, like, what about us? I want more legendaries for my Commander deck. Well, nobody else does, including other people, the majority of people in your own Commander community and everybody playing Standard and everybody everywhere. We don't want more legendaries. Also, like I said, this person seems to be confusing Mythic and Legendary. I guess they think they're the same thing. And then also the set does have Arlen and it does have, uh, what is his name, Tovalar or whatever. So the correct answer to his question about uh, there, there's not enough Legendary and Mythic Werewolves, even though there are Legendary and Mythic Werewolves, I want more for Commander, wah, wah, wah. The correct answer is shut the f*** up. Mark's answer is Werewolves are a tricky theme to build a Commander deck around. Yeah, that just is a bad tribal to pick. You'd, you'd be better off with, like, honestly, like, saprolings or snakes. Even they're easier and their support is garbage. So a lot of design time went into making Tovalar the best werewolf commander, but we uh, just couldn't find a second design that didn't uh, just feel like something you'd skip over to play Tovalar. <laughs> yeah, maybe, uh, maybe you went a little too high on the power level there, just saying. Uh, we did have a black, red, green legendary creature in the file for a short time that liked double-faced cards. Hmm. Uh, but it didn't pan out on several vectors, us not having three color cards in the set. There's one. And it not playing that great behind the two big ones. Yeah, that'd be a weird thing to throw in because then you have to take something away from, I guess, like the colorless spot, which, okay, fine. You know, there's almost no equipment in this set or whatever. Most of it's colored. Or, I don't know, you gotta throw off the balance somewhere, which it, they, they act like that's the end of the world. I, I don't think so. For draft, you could probably go 2, 3, 4% off on the color balance effect they usually do. People never talk about that. So, I mean, yeah, he's got a point there, though. But, um... My point is, shut up, Commander assholes, who just, I want something better, I want a new Commander, I want something better, I want a new Commander, I want to build another Commander deck. Mine isn't good enough, or there's power creep in my playgroup, and now I need something new, I gotta rebuild my whole deck. Get a less toxic, less arms racy uh, group of friends and play with them instead, how about that? And then leave our standard products alone instead of putting OP legendary bullshit in it. Next question. The adversary cycle seems to disagree with rarity is about complexity, not power. Oh, here we go. It's one of these people. Tainted adversary, for example, is a 2-3 for 1 plus uh, black with two upsides. Has something changed? Or could we expect a 2-3 vanilla for uh, the same mana cost at common? I didn't even get that last part, but this, this person just seems like a douche. Rarity is about more things than just complexity. There you go. There you go. He said it. I was going to say it, but Mark said it. Uh, each rarity, for instance, serves different purposes. See, sometimes the rarity is for draft. Sometimes the rarity is to say it. You know, that's the power level, and that, like you can get away with more if it's mythic or legendary. But sometimes it's because there was a spot open in the sheet in that rarity. I mean, let's just be honest. 
Sometimes there's a, a moderately okay card, but it would be just a disaster for a draft. And so they hide it in higher rarity. Sometimes there's a hyper-powered card, but they want it to be the backbone of a certain draft strategy or draft color because nobody would draft the color otherwise, so they put it in the uncommon slot. So to say, oh, it's uh, rarity is all about complexity, not power, and that's it. Well, well no. I, I don't even know where he got that idea, and the first sentence Mark says is, no, rarity is about more than just complexity. I'd love to know where he heard that from, if any of you know. Yeah, he does go on to mention uh, constructed versus sealed and modern and, you know, popper even, I think probably. And yeah, yeah, I mean, duh. Like, you already know the answer. This person doesn't. He must have actually just looked up the dumbest questions he could find. I can't wait for part two of this. Next up, another unbelievably informed question. What made you decide to do Innistrad two sets in a row? They didn't. It started as one and they split it. They didn't decide, hey, let's stay on the same plane for two, like two, two sets in a row and then let's work from there. It started as one and then split into. I, I would assume that it was poorly phrased and that's what this person meant, but it's been an absolute moron parade so far in the question section. So I don't think they know that it started as one set and split into two. Oh, look, Mark answers with originally it wasn't two sets in a row. It was one. In fact, he even says the following set was going to be Kamigawa and Neon Dynasty. Now, this is news. That was supposed to be in the same time slot as it releases now. Um, what? You moved Midnight Hunt back a couple weeks. You moved Crimson Vow out a couple weeks, implying that it was one set and it was going to be in the middle. It was going to be on October. But now it got split to September and November, implying that no, Kamigawa Neon Dynasty was not going to be in November. So I don't know where Mark got that idea. I'd like to take his word for it on there, but I don't think that that's actually correct. Because, I mean, the, let me just address the elephant in the room. Why the hell would they do five sets in, in one year if they didn't have to? They split this one in two at the last second. And we're like, well, I guess we'll do five sets. Why the hell would they like, oh, let's just fit another one in there because nine sets legal, ten sets legal. Hell, make it 11. Let's do a sixth set. Yeah, Standard needs to have more sets before rotation. That went well. It's always in such a great state when it's around eight or nine legal. So the question is bullshit. The answer is bullshit. Let's move on. Hi, editing desk here. And I, I went over this because I thought there's no way that Mark just said that. And it turns out he may not have. There's two ways to interpret what he said. We basically have pronoun confusion. I think that he means Kamigawa was going to come out when it's coming out now. Not when Crimson Vow is coming out now. That makes a lot more sense, so I'm just going to assume that's what he meant, but, like, maybe not. Next up, another stupid question. How come the 13 theme was reduced so much compared to previous Innistrad visits? Hmm, maybe because they already did that. But then again, they already did it in the first Innistrad, so, I mean, okay, but still. Um, oh, this is interesting. It turns out, once again, the person asking the question is just simply incorrect or exaggerating. He says, it's reduced, I guess by one card one card i don't know why he says i guess because then he like literally quotes it he says um <laughs> original innistrad had four cards that mechanically referenced 13 army of the damn blasphemous act into the maw of hell and ludwig's abomination wait i thought tragic slip was in there is that not a 13 one am i forgetting that anyway uh so midnight hunt has three jaren corrupted bishop olivia's midnight ambush and triska decophile so it's not like they abandon it. I mean, my God, it's almost the same number. Now, I kind of wonder how many were in, like, SOI. It, it was, though, at least two. Wasn't it, like, the, something with the tree and then something with the Triskaidekaphobia? I'm sure there was more, too. So get this. He says, the tradition, interestingly, started as a joke. I could have guessed that. Uh, Into the Maw of Hell was originally pitched uh, as doing 10 damage, but I suggested changing it to 13 to make it feel a little more unique and felt 13 added some creepiness to it. I mean, 10 and 13, there's almost no difference. What, it can kill Galta? Like, I, I get it. And, like, doing doing silly stuff like that, I think, adds a little personality. Um, kind of, like, in, in the best possible way, as opposed to how they did things in, in uh, the D&D &D set where they just, like, named spells stupid shit. And then they made, like, fake keywords in italics that weren't keywords. They were, like, ability words, and everybody was confused by that. Yeah, that's how not to do stupid flavor and references and, and, and shit like that. Just throwing 13 in because you can. I mean, there you go. Like, that's that's how you nail it. So he says the team liked it, obviously. So we started looking for other places to use 13. Then after, uh, whenever anyone made an Innistrad set, it just became a thing to do when we found a spot for it. Uh, 13 is a big number, though, so there usually isn't a lot of ways to reference it, meaning it usually only shows up on a handful of cards. If I'd have thought for 
10 seconds instead of three seconds, I would have come up with that answer too. God, these questions are so stupid. Twitter people are among the dumbest people on the planet. Oh, then he throws in a fun little uh, little fact here. Uh, it was pointed out to me that before Innistrad Midnight Hunt, there were exactly 13 cards referencing the number 13 in Innistrad sets, which actually means that Shadows and Eldritch had a ton of them, because he said there's only four in original Innistrad. Although that's original Innistrad. Maybe there's some in, in like, Avacyn or whatever. He didn't say set or block. He just said the name Innistrad. So um, hmm. that's why I feel like there's more. Yeah, whatever. Okay, so, I mean, there, there's almost the same number as what he's saying, so shut up, you're wrong. I mean, that's pretty much... It, I, he could have just in, saved some time and said, shut up, you're wrong, 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 for, like, most of these questions. In fact, the next question is, the set looks great, Mark. Shut up, you're wrong. <laughs> was there ever a point in design when investigate slash clues matter was a bigger theme? Maybe a full draft archetype in the set, like it was in Shadows Over Innistrad. I'm going to guess that he says we don't want to do the exact same thing twice because we already did it, and that would be stupid. And blah, 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 fine line between a callback and reinforcing a thing for eternal formats and, and making it the exact same thing over again, and then we already did flashback, and blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's see what he actually says. That's that's what I'm going to guess he says. You know, I, I purposely use one software window to block the answer before I read them. So, okay, unblocking it now. When we started working on Vision Design for Innistrad Midnight Hunt, we went back and looked at the five past expansions that had been uh, set on Innistrad and made a list of every mechanic we thought could return. We knew Transform and TDFCs would be coming back because everybody hates them and we hate the community. Oh, pardon me, I, I, I misread that. It actually says, comma, um, <laughs> as, as they make up the core mechanical identity of the world. Uh, they were also uh, eager to bring back Flashback because everybody hates that too. Uh, that was the reason it got pulled from Strixhaven, thank God. And then they basically put in Storm, and then Flying as a mechanic. That's that's great. That went well. Uh, the new Daymount Nightbound mechanic we were interested in was obviously an extension of the Werewolf mechanic, um, or you know slash Tribal. Uh, finally, we decided to add in just a tiny bit of Investigate in Clues because they had been so popular and thought uh, they were easy to use in small numbers. Yeah, it's kind of like Treasures, where they just kind of leak Treasures into some other sets because it's just, it's single-use mana, and this is single-use card draw. Like, that's like time-delayed and cost mana, but it's also like colorless-ish. So, and then it's also Artifact Affinity, so like it, it kind of reaches into these other things where it's not really its own thing and it doesn't have to be. Which, okay, he went a little more specific with that. I mean, I would have just said, why would we do the same thing twice? Like, in exactly the same amounts. Uh, Vision Design only had uh, two, I assume he means two cards. Uh, and then Set Design kept it in. Oh, yeah, I, I was, geez, I would have guessed like five. But yeah, I guess it's only on two cards. Wow. So basically he says they didn't eliminate it, but they didn't make it bigger. So, all right. Never was a bigger theme. Never got cut. They just threw it in and were like, all right. Next up, we've got an actual interesting question. Holy shit, that only took about a dozen. What new thing, so card, mechanic, character, uh, creature, flavor text, etc., in this set surprised and or delighted you? Oh, he's going to name some broken shit. He's going to say the doubler. He's going to say the doubler. If he says the doubler, I'm going to drive out to Seattle and slap him. That's a joke. I'm not actually serious. Plus, I would fly there. Uh, usually, the thing that surprises and delights me the most is when we find a game component that makes you rethink things uh, that you thought you'd already wrapped your mind around. Decayed creature tokens were the mechanic in Innistrad Midnight Hunt that most did that for me. It really took the idea of a creature token and twisted it. You guys know, I made a video about this. Just because tokens are tokens doesn't mean you got to treat them like they're lesser than like an identical creature that's on a real card. Unless, I guess, you care about the number of creature cards in your graveyard. Like, there's, you know, there's these couple little things. Or, like, you want to flicker it, or you want to return it to play after it dies, which you can't do with a token. Like, you know, tokens are tokens that work differently. But generally, one of the biggest mistakes made by amateur players and even, like, like mid-range players are they, they treat a token as throwaway because it's a token. It is, let's just say, a 3-3 three, three creature, okay? Treat it like any other 3-3 three, three creature, unless you have a reason not to. People are like, uh, should I chump block this or not? Like, I'm, I, it's a 5-5, five, five, I'm going to lose it, but it doesn't have trample. Do I take the 5 or do I chump block it? Oh, I really, my deck cares about creature count, but it's just a token. No, no, you're wrong. You should not. If, if, if Just treat it like any other creature. If nothing in your deck cares about it being a token, then leave it in play. It's not less valuable because it's a token, unless it is specifically less valuable because it's a token. 
So the whole, ha, 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 we made them disposable. Oh, just YOLO swing with them all. When really, if you've seen the, the ones that people are actually playing, it's the exact opposite. You absolutely conserve them until the, the puppet factory comes out or um, you get like death triggers to pile on top. It's not like, ha, ha, if I swing with five, I can overflow by two, but I'll lose three of them. Oh, well, they're just tokens and they have decayed. Although, I mean, they can't block. So it's like, okay, they actually are legitimately less valuable. But reinforcing the the... the incorrect and negative uh, assumption in people's heads that tokens are less valuable is a way to like send people in the wrong direction strategically if they want to be an optimal player. So I don't think that that was very good. And plus, it, it's, it's like, oh, a throwaway piece of crap that only does two damage and can't block... Well, that's useless, and then I thought, well, okay, how are they going to make them not useless? Oh, yeah, death triggers, recursion, creating one per turn for free, and then, yeah, they went and did all of that. I could have told you that on day one of the spoilers. In fact, I probably did. And if there's two things in the last two years that people hate more than anything else, it's unlimited free tokens for doing nothing and amplified death triggers because of the stupid pest deck and all this aristocrat bullshit going honestly all the way back to i think shadows when you want to kill your opponent's creatures to get them out of the way but then that's the whole point they want them dead too and there's nothing you can do because if you leave them in play they're going to keep smashing you in the face in combat but then if you kill them or you board wipe or whatever well then you get all these death triggers and then every death trigger is another trigger and then every time they gain life you lose life again ha 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 it's a no-win scenario you're just looking at the board you're like i don't have a way to exile these i'm not playing white oh i guess i just lose it's the only way to play around is life gain which is also white so you're just looking at a line of like six pests and you're like, I'm going to lose the game eventually. There is literally nothing I can do other than what, trample past them? Oh, well, they'll just block with all six of them and then all the triggers all die. Or, and then they've got that multi-sack Strixhaven horse shit that should have been banned a hundred years ago. Just something in the pest deck needs to be banned. It, it's, it's just such a feels bad bro kind of scenario where there's no upside, there's no win, there's nothing you can do, control can't even get you out of it, and you just see more and more pests and more and more triggers going off and more, you know, more trigger generators hitting the battlefield, and you're just like, why do I, why am I even still in this? Why am I even playing this game? They need to stop doing dumb shit like that, and then, oh, look, self-destructing throwaway zombies. Great, I wonder if people will put them in an aristocrat's deck. Oh, look, people put them in an aristocrat's deck. Who would have thought? So I think that uh, Decade is the worst thing in the entire set. By far, that that and like just, you know, Red Rush Werewolf Blitz horse shit that doesn't even let you build something that goes to turn five. So he wrote basically a book under this, but I'm not interested in hearing what he says because he's wrong. So the next question was Decade designed with the goal of making token, uh, making token making cheaper. I would have said making token creation, but that's because I used to be an author and this person used to be an idiot and still is because they're on Twitter. Or was it a top down flavor design first? You know what? Who gives a shit? In fact, he says neither. <laughs> Decade came about because we were trying to solve a problem. We wanted uh, uh, attacking zombie hordes to be a thing, but we found a lot of the ways we've done it in the past leads to more of a control strategy. Well, yeah, because it's paired with blue all the time, especially in this set, uh, than a build up and attack strategy. Yeah, so they just made them not be able to block and made them die. And then everybody just put them in aristocrats and mix them with green. So, uh, oops. Wow, play design completely missed the mark on what they intended, and, and the users did something else. Or the players, I should say. I'm used to software engineering. Everybody's a user to me. I could be designing a sandwich for a restaurant. I'll be like, the end users are going to like this. So he said, first they just started with not letting them block, and then playtesting showed that they were still a little uh, too strong to produce them at the volume that we wanted. Uh, so then everybody just resorted to death triggers and aristocrats, and yeah. He didn't say that. He said something else, but I'm correcting it on the fly. So the final question... What was the crux of the decision to leave certain characters out of Innistrad Midnight Hunt, such as Audric, Thalia, or Geralt? I bet he's just going to give some generic, like, I don't know, we, we tried and then they didn't fit, so we cut them, or... Oh, wait, maybe it's a trick question, because almost every single person asking a question has been completely and utterly wrong so far. I bet Audric, Thalia, and Geralt are dead. That would actually be hilarious. Um, I, I know Audric was referenced on one card, though, but it doesn't mean he's still around. I don't know. I read Shadows. I didn't read, I think, Eldritch Moon, or I didn't finish it, or I, I don't know. So he says, the crux of the decision was that we had two Innistrad sets to make and wanted to make sure both sets have legendary creatures the audience would be excited to see. And so you brought in Teferi? <laughs> oh my god. Anyway, that meant some of them had to be saved for Innistrad Crimson Vow. Ooh, wink, wink, nod, nod, spoiler. 
By the way, it's got to be like almost spoiler season for Crimson Vow because there's such a like not gap between them. Like, what is it, like eight weeks or something? Anyway, uh, uh, how did we decide which legendary creatures went into which set? First, we looked at the story. Uh, if a character, okay, that's not entirely true, I should say. They usually give them general mechanics and characters and then tell the story team to write a story around it. But if they had, I guess, a story in mind, like a general story of like, oh, there will be a wedding, they might have kind of had that like that one paragraph like oh there's going to be a wedding and olivia's involved or whatever they're like oh well you know who would be great for that Audric. so i mean it usually doesn't go in that order but i guess i could kind of see what he's saying you know like for brand new planes i know he's made statements that it completely works in reverse but for return to planes eh, it's a little different so that's why i wanted to mention that because then then the plane kind of writes the set instead of the set writing the plane you know you ever notice that the return sets are always the most wonky and just don't work and the most bands because they let the the lore and the set drive the card design instead of just making a good set and then just bullshitting some story and plain lore into it. It's almost like one of them should be a higher priority. Hmm. Now, I haven't read the story yet, but he does say that uh, the two Innistrad sets have a connected story. Okay, makes sense, because they started as one set. Uh, each playing up a different event. Uh, yeah, one's the Harvest Tide Festival and one's the wedding. Whatever, cool, great. Uh, we tended to save them for uh the set where the part of the story occurs oh i see okay okay so some crossover and they're, they're all there second we looked at uh what we might want to do mechanically with that character and uh which set would be a better fit there you go that's how you design a set uh third uh we have a good sense of what characters player uh, characters players are most excited by and then try to divvy them up evenly so that both sets have a fair share so get this, he even says, so where are specifically Audric, Thalia, and Gareth? They're in Crimson Vow. So all three of them confirmed in Crimson Vow, and that is the end of the article. Ooh, good way to end it. So I hope you guys uh, appreciated this deep dive into Mark Rosewater's uh, crazy-ass mind. Um, it's really just him telling 80% of the people they're wrong and then explaining unbelievably basic things to dumbasses. And then, like, two interesting things. So, um... Can't wait for part two. Can't be this shit. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.